Okay, I'd like to call the June work session to order and remind everybody that we are recording, uh, but we are not live streaming this work session. Um, Mr. Francis, Mr. Chuck Francis is not going to be here with us tonight. I'm filling in for him. He is celebrating his mother's 90th birthday. So happy birthday uh, there. And I believe Mr. Larry Henson's also celebrating a birthday as well as Dr. Nolte's wife is celebrating a birthday. So we've got, this is the birthday month. Um, also, uh, Mr. Bobby Rogers is not going to be with us. Um, I believe his father fails uh, today, and so he's taking care of his father. So uh, please be praying uh, for his father and for Bobby's family. Make sure you know, he's okay. And I do believe Mr. Henson may be lost or is, is calling in he should be able to hear us now okay. mr henson can you hear us maybe muted if not we may have to get the tech people to check on him okay well, i think he's trying to log see in. his i see his icon up there <laughs> on the screen all right um at this time i am going to turn it over to i think miss lisa thompson is first on the agenda tonight You have a digital copy of the AIG plan um, in its entirety. Tonight, I just wanted to give you um, a brief overview. The, the plan in its entirety is, was given to you digitally on the Moodle, and an overview is in your folder. Um, but I, This plan revision um, is required by state law to occur every three years. And we took the opportunity through this school year to really take a deep dive into where we are, what our needs are, um, what things we can do better. And it's been a great opportunity to learn more about the program and, and get to know the parents and really think about what we need for AIG. Um, we have a great program and there are not you know we don't have extensive changes to the plan but i do want to make you aware of of all the parts we have six standards that we're required to address within our plan and i wanted to give you just a quick highlight each of those and if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer those um, standard one is student identification and this is how we screen for and refer take referrals and how what areas that we identify our gifted children in and our um, this year a couple changes to that is that we really want to incorporate a new teacher rating scale that's a little broader and really encompasses um, more traits of gifted children and we're really excited to to use that and kind of highlight give that a chance to see how that goes as you know as you're probably aware the rating scale does not determine it helps a student qualify but it cannot it does not keep a student from qualifying we also want to provide parents with more charts and graphs um, that explain the processes so they're very comfortable and very aware of each step of the process as we move through possible identification. Standard two really addresses the comprehensive programming and services that we offer within the program. Um, not a lot of changes to that. We really want to be a little more comprehensive and thoughtful in our talent development and do that through, you know, keeping that talent development in the classroom every day through differentiate, differentiation and work with our teachers, um, giving them suggestions and ideas and professional development to do that successfully. Standard three um, is really about differentiated curriculum um, in the regular classroom and how we meet all of the needs of, of gifted children in the regular classroom. And there's not really any changes to that area. Standard four is, talks a lot about professional development. Um, the biggest change there is that, is that we are going to have an AIG Google Classroom that teachers can access at any time and they can, they can have resources and professional ava uh, development available for them. 
And standard five is, is our partnerships, how we work with our parents and, and we want to expand the ways that we share information in our digital world. Um, but essentially that, that standard is, is unchanged too. We just want to provide more or graphic organizers and, and resources for parents. Standard six is, is really about program accountability. Um, we continue to have very high standards and, and have a great program. Um, not a lot of changes. We just want to continue to reach out to our parents and, and have good CV input for them, from them so we can continually get better. Right. You have this plan that you can look through in full right. on the digital Moodle. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Uh, does any board member have any questions uh, um, that they would like to ask or any comments? Just got one comment that I noticed. I, I like the idea of us continually working to improve our communication with parents and with the community. Like I say, that transparency has always gone a long way in our school system, and we want to keep it up. And I noticed this program, again, is reflecting upon the good work that this our administrative staff's doing. Dr. Nolte? You may have other questions about that. Um, I just uh, wanted to point out Monday night's agenda. We've been giving that to you ahead of time. I don't think we need to pause and read it, but if you all see something that you want us to add or um, talk about, if you'll let us know during the meeting or after the meeting or certainly before Monday. That's in the, everybody's packet, so everybody should have the agenda for Monday night as well. Thank you, Mr. I probably should have announced that we will be having our regular um, June board meeting on the 13th um, here at the EC Center. Any other questions? Thank you again. Uh, now, Mr. Dr. Put Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Members of the board, I've got um, four items I'd like to discuss with you. Um, the first is fuel costs. Um, what I would propose for consideration, and obviously not for action tonight, but just for consideration, is a rate increase on our uh, activity bus buses. Currently, that rate is, a, is at $1.20 a mile. And I would propose a rate increase of $1.75. Reason for the increase uh, is replacing the activity bus fleet has increased and the cost of fuel mileage has gone up. I'm gonna give you a number here. <coughs> July 28th, 2021, uh, for a fill on diesel, Sixteen thousand one hundred and forty-two dollars in this past month of May, June sixteenth of twenty twenty-two. Same field. There's there's about uh, two hundred gallons difference. Thirty-six thousand five hundred and eleven dollars and ninety-seven cents. And so, um, you know, mileage is paid locally. And we absorb as much of that so as not to overburden our schools. Uh, but we are absorbing a disproportionate amount and it's making it near to impossible to replace buses. We've got one that was flooded out and insurance paid out, I wanna say about $8,000. Uh, a brand new bus, uh, anywhere from 90 to $120,000. So I think we just purchased one for about 98 and, and that was a demo and we got a deal on it and what have you. So um, a rate increase on mileage for activity buses uh, is needed and I know that'll be discussed further uh, in finance committee on Monday. Uh, Mr. Sharp will be here to discuss with finance but I just wanted to throw that Pose change out for consideration. Would there be any questions on activity bus? Well, I, I do question. Just I know that you got to. I know the funds. I know get fuels costing more, and I know that it needs to be. It's got to be paid for from somewhere. Um, do so that'll come out of just gate money or 
the out of the school's funds. Do you think, uh, <clears throat> I guess, I know it's putting undue <coughs> pressure on the district level, school level, and so forth. I guess uh, where, where will they get that money? So, yeah, from uh, an assundry uh, of pots, some is the admission or gate sales, some is sometimes it's Pepsi money, sometimes it's fundraisers, uh, but they have multiple forms of, of collections. Okay. Sometimes we, we often think about middle school and high school because they're getting on activity buses and going to extracurricular activities. Uh, you know, band, chorus, uh, sports, and that kind of stuff. There also, there's also some elementary use, and um, elementaries have some discretionary local funds in their local bank accounts. But very often, what they'll do too is they'll they'll know that uh, 50 students are going on the trip, and so they'll add a dollar or two, whatever they think the mileage costs are, plus um, if they have to hire a bus driver and things like that plus the ticket in the door, sometimes they'll add that to the total cost and collect it that way. Okay, that. I just know, I just know that that's, I guess every time you pass it on down, it just squeezes everybody's budgets. And of course, it's all, none of us signed up for that, but that's what we got. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So we're going from one, so we're going from 120 a mile to 175 a mile. That's what you're going to propose to finance, and then they can talk about it. That's correct. So we're talking about. Thirty-six cents. So you're telling me it went up a hundred percent. Well, I mean, diesel fuel is. Uh, that's what I'm saying. A hundred percent. It went it, actually about 103 percent. Really, just tell you the. the, the honest truth well the i mean i'm sort of like uh, david over here i mean they've got to be i mean where especially you start talking about sports like you said at the middle school and high school levels where they don't make up at 55 cents i mean are they going to i mean because hopefully i mean uh, the way I look at it, I mean, I'm hoping we're using an activity bus way before or after the season's over with going to playoffs. And I mean, I know that, but that's just 55 cents that the school's going to have to eat. I think if I find that's better start looking at Money. some other ways to maybe help out the schools in that sense. I mean, yeah, we know. we currently have in our fleet. <laughs> Ain't that easy? Yeah, my, we're still absorbing. We currently have in our fleet the one flooded out bus, and we've got uh, I know of at least a couple that are 27 to 30 years old. And the repair and replacement. It's one of those things that you have to get ahead to be ahead. We can't get ahead because we keep spending it on maintenance and replacement uh, breakdowns. Worse school mileage um, and so uh, finance I don't envy uh, their decision in that it's it's a balance between safety and efficiency versus uh, an additional burden uh, to the schools I think Mr. Rogers may have just he just whispered something he might can I say something go ahead what do you want to ask him? go ahead and say it why don't you ask well, I'll ask you. Okay. Well, I was just wondering if it might be we might start looking at the opportunities of like hiring Brookshire's or somebody like that in this long run with the fuel prices increasing. I know they're increasing their price as well. It may end up being less expensive on us to look into that category as far as if we don't like long trips or playoffs, stuff like that. Their bus, their bus and rental may end up be costing us less money than using our own activity buses. Our kids, um, our, our schools, uh, I know at least, well, both both uh, st uh, regular high schools have used um, Young Bus Lines, Char uh, Brookshire, um, and I can't remember the cost, but it's essentially about $50 a kid or person riding those buses. That, 
it may come out cheaper, but I'd be shocked if it's not at least double what we're proposing here. Um, and y'all know I just tell you what, what I know to be accurate, and sometimes it's just not real popular. We're, we're expected to spend somewhere between um, 800000 and 1.2, hopefully not more than 1.25 of our fund balance for the year that just ended. We'll know more about that. The auditors are here right now. That would be in the neighborhood of about half of our fund balance. Um, we're trying to combat that by resizing. We've talked about that at previous work sessions where we've gone from 7,100 students down to a little more than 6,500 students. And I'll give you an update on that, the particular situation in closed session, and then you all will have an opportunity to see that again on Monday. But, you know, we're looking at being down maybe 20 people and I'm still not sure that'll cover everything that's in the budget. Um, certainly we'll work on a really good funding formula early in the fall. I talked to Bryant Moorhead about that on the phone yesterday about the timing of that. So what we have is um, not to make light of it, but what we have is the same problem everybody else has. We have uh, very high inflation and our Funding is pretty fixed with the funding formula. I do think the commissioners will be favorable. I can't speak for them, and I certainly don't vote. But it's it's tight right now, and we're taking a number of steps to get back down uh, in terms of support to our actual size. But it's it'll be hard to find a uh, a ton of extra money. Well, <clears throat> I'd let Taylor say something, but she she might be more specific. Well, um, Dr. Nolte, I'll say I agree with you. We need to protect some fund balance because we definitely don't want that to get too low. So it's it's obviously a balance and act like everybody else that's dealing with the budget. So I, I respect that part of it for sure. I think if we can make all the changes we need to make by early next fall, we'll be in a little better shape. But until all that happens, it'll be, it'll be pretty tough. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next item. That one was a hit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think like when you come that to present it to the, the finance, could you bring like how much, how many gallons will you have you used over the last few years and and sort of what it. some of the costs would be, and that way we could go over it in finance. Yeah, I have all those totals. Okay, good. Thank you. Average field, just for your edification, is about 7,000 gallons. Okay. And that happens mm. every month, couple months, depends on how much use, how much uh, the buses have been in use. All right, um, so next is a driver's ed fee. Uh, that I would also propose a rate hike there. Again, not something anyone wants to do. The student cost right now is $45. I would propose that we raise that to $55, so that's an increase of $10. Um, also would increase um, consider uh, raising the, the class portion and, and what that does is basically uh, again the cars that we're trying to replace in driver's ed are more expensive than they were even a year ago um, far greater expense than two years ago and so over time you trend up um, and so in looking at replacing those cars and paying our driver's ed instructors uh, that offset is needed. Um, so would increase the class portion, which is a 30 hour required class to $750. I'm sorry, I don't know what it was previously. It wasn't included for me, uh, but that would be the proposed increase okay. to 750. I don't know what the <coughs> is. Is that what the students pay, 750? Correct. 
Yeah, we'll go back and look at that. That's another situation where you're putting fuel fuel in those vehicles too that the state uh, does not provide fuel. They do provide some money for driver's ed, but uh, doesn't cover all the cost. Give me those numbers again. You said driving part forty-five to fifty-five dollars, and then the class was what again? Seven fifty would be the proposed increase. I don't know what the previous amount. Uh, it wasn't included in, in the notes I have. You know about what state rates paying? I mean, what we're paying state rate for diesel fuel now? What? Five twenty a gallon. I I wouldn't know that because, and I would be afraid to guess because it it can move forty cents from field to field on a gallon. You know, if if we got it in in uh, May and we had to go for another fill in July, it could move move the needle as much as forty cents with between fills and I'd just be afraid I would be surely guessing did you say seven thousand per basically per month in diesel fuel um, that's approximately yes. correct yeah. okay and that is that's not just white buses that's yellow yeah. buses as yeah. well I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm either confused or I've missed something did you say seven hundred and fifty dollars class or seven dollars and fifty cents maybe he's put I, i'll get you that answer seven hundred and fifty dollars for a class that the school system is offering which the state gives money for some stuff i don't think that's right i mean i uh, i'll get you an that's answer. for a class for seven hundred and fifty dollars that does sound a little high but we'll, to, get it, we'll get it double is that check. paying the instructor I think the the I think that's what we were paying I the instructor yes, yeah, to I don't pay, think to teach the class. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I don't think it's the 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 parents are paying for. It. I think that's what the instructor is getting to <laughs> teach the thirty hour class. Okay. Well, yeah, my yeah, my daughter. Mr. Francis, I think you're correct. Okay, I, I believe that that would be correct. I. I don't think it, I don't think yes it was that I, I read I looked too quickly okay yeah, that's that's what we pay our instructors I think it was 750 was like maybe 650 or right at seven hundred dollars prior so it's a yes a little bit of an increase My apologies I had that incorrect can I ask the question did we not increase that last year I think we did and the reason why we increased it last year is because we actually got extra money from a state so where is this money coming from so it would be a student contribution at a rate ten dollars higher than they paid last year. And what did the students pay last year? Or is that what you're saying? Forty five to fifty five. So that's the class that's what they're paying is fifty five dollars. Yes, okay. and I had that all messed because up. Because if I'm not mistaken, what we did last year is we was paying too the students was paying too much. So we pretty much offset some of that money and gave the instructors a little more money. So now you're saying that we're going to go up ten more dollars and then pay the instructors more. Yeah. I mean, is that making sense? Am I missing something here? I'm not recalling the conversation from last year, and I'm I'm just well, no. I'm I'm just recalling. Yeah we're up in the rate but then we're given more to the instructors which we gave more to the instructors last year but we didn't change nothing because we had extra money somewhere well i can remember i think it'd be a good time a good chance for you to do some homework and let us know yeah i think we of, need to the rest of the story yeah. monday will be good okay uh, yeah, I was well, going to say finance, something right. along the same lines, Mr. Burnett. This, this is why we have work sessions. Yeah, we'll let right. finance try to work that out Monday. So we can well, please uh, do. Uh, <laughs> ease out all the pieces <laughs> before you all have a chance to vote on something. All right. All right. Sorry for any confusion. Uh, that's okay. Let's talk about the PISGA fuel costs. All right. Uh, PISGA fuel costs, lost revenues. Um, the school uh, came and met with me the other day, and I am looking for one very specific sheet. 
while he's looking, you know um, that most of their games are essentially all away. That, that's what we're talking about. So um, practice is uh, requires travel. Uh, so Pisgah come to meet with me. Uh, they've been keeping those buses hot, uh, going to the first available practice location that they could get to. Uh, they have to take an activity bus uh, just for anyone who's interested, they get about five miles to the gallon uh, in fuel. And so um, they've been paying that rate. And again, this is another thing, the counter or offset that the finance committee needs to have, talking about a rate increase. Um, <laughs> they have spent um, considering away games and practices uh, 6000 Nine hundred eighty-seven dollars and eighty cents. They've also spent thirteen hundred dollars in field prep. You know, back to the days of chalking it or uh, painting it, lining it off, mowing it. Additional fuel for that. Uh, probably the largest number is the concessions. Uh, they have lost $21,747.49. That's on an average of what they bring in in concessions. Um, and then the baseball gate, um, they lost it, $3,657. For a grand total loss of $33,692. Are you talking all athletics from since the flood last year? Yes. Up until school got out. Okay. That's correct. That's their total realized uh, loss uh, for the year. Yeah, and that's athletics. That would be football, soccer, baseball, softball, softball soccer, men and women. Am I right? Well, football should be practicing at the practice field, though, right? That's yeah, and that's where the field prep comes yeah, in. Field prep, that would be that. And then them going all, all the way other, games. All the other ones are having to travel, right? That's correct. Is there any the insurance baseball. money that could kick in for lost revenues or anything um, due to a, a covered loss? If, if the insurance money is kicking in to cover some of the, the damage that was done, is there any kind of loss of income that would we could file with the insurance, or is there any FEMA funds that could we could we could turn around? I mean, if we paid this, is there any way to recover it back through? Yeah, pay back. Yeah, FEMA or insurance. We've been unable to recover it so far. Okay. Um, because again, um, what they're looking, they don't, they can't really assign a dollar amount to concessions. Mm -hmm. That's not. They don't see that as a loss. It's just no gain. Right. Um, gate sales kind of the same way. They don't really see it as something you lost. You just didn't realize a gain. So those are harder to claim. But we have went down that road. Okay. Thank you. I guess that's all, that's all important. More important that we get those fields fixed quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, which, if y'all are ready, I'll move to my uh, fourth and final one was there any we question to there what uh, the, the 33,692 losses is that just a I mean that's just for our information or are they are they trying to help let us try to find some ways to help them they that? they would like and I would recommend that we try to make need to recoup all. yeah I got to do we're not looking to give them money right we're trying to you know when COVID hit and there was loss of gate sales we we made both high schools whole because they, they realized some real loss and incurred some real expenses like helmet replacement and reconditioning that has to happen every single year, whether you want to or not. Um, not all of them, but you know, there's a portion designated to have to be reconditioned. Uh, there's real costs for clock operators. There's real costs for streaming. There's real costs for, you know, their uh, officials. All of those are real costs uh, that occurred in COVID with no income. And so both high schools were made whole um, because this board chose to do so. Uh, Pisgah is experiencing it again because of the flood. Is that a $33,000 
negative overall in the athletic department or just $33,000 loss from those specific athletic events? Yeah, it's it's not a negative. Okay, I don't so want to mislead. As a whole, their athletic department's still above water. That's correct. Okay. Okay. It is correct. And um, they've, they've just been paying it and going because they have to pay it and go because they want the kids to have the opportunities they can have. But – it's starting to impact the opportunities they're able to provide because of it. I would just concur that I think we need to do this, and I'm the person who really watches the local budget along with the chief financial officer and tries to get it in, in place and tries to make sure that we get additional revenues if we can get them and that we make reductions, reduce line items. We've done a lot of that. But this is a catastrophic event, and we don't want them to have a significant disadvantage. Uh, again, I don't think we give them more than they would not nor more than they would normally bring in. But I do think that is a reasonable amount to bring them back, and then we'll deal with next year when next year gets here. Say so when we do have. Uh, away games and everything's called away games now for sure. Uh, <clears throat> during those times, the other facilities we visit, that, that might have been their away game instead of the home game, have any of these other schools offered to say, hey, we're going to maybe split a little funds with y'all or probably not, but I didn't know if that's been a, any gestures from any other districts, that, I mean, schools we visited. I'll just say uh, most folks were very sympathetic early on. Right. Yeah. That waned over time. That's why I'm thinking that's probably out, out the door right at this time. But One of the incentives, too, for um, thanking people for allowing us to use their facilities, and they have been very generous for quite some time now, is, um, you know, to let them – do the concessions and to not do that plus you can imagine the difficulty of hauling supplies and materials over there and staffing a concession area that you weren't used to so um, i don't know every plan that they have uh, or every agreement that they've had with every school but i do know the schools have given them use to the access to the facilities and pisgah has also said well you can do this and do this for your generosity and I think that's fair do they keep the gate also on the way get the gate don't we? no we we actually got the gate it was the concessions so I'll just be clear for finance are we going to make up the 6,987 <coughs> plus the 1,300 or are we going to try to make up the 33,000 what I would uh, recommend is making up the $33,692. And we're going to try to pull that out of local to give to Pisgah? That's the only thing we have. And as you know, local is in the hole. But we're working to very to hard sure, to uh, been around so much. I kind of lost that. which numbers and where it was coming from. I just wanted to verify. Yeah, local's really the only place to get that kind of stuff. Uh, so you're going to have to have a bake sale. Something. We need a little help over here. And, not him. <laughs> yeah, no, not him. But you know people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, we've got the county commissioners. There are like three from your side of the county. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Let's go, Brandon. I don't know. All right. Any other questions on the the fees and fuel? All right, let's talk about FEMA updates. All right. So a little bit of good news. Um, we have cleared yet another major hurdle. Um, FEMA has what's known as an eight-step process. Anyone ever involved in a federal project knows this eight-step process to be very strenuous. And um, the last portion is actually an environmental study. There's a historical study. Uh, and with our lands around here, uh, much of it had some Native American history to it, so it had to be researched to make sure we weren't disturbing what would be um, traditionally a historical land. So uh, all that to say the eight-step process has been completed. 
we have agreed, we being Haywood County Schools in conjunction with CDC and FEMA have agreed on a scope of work. Um, the uh, scope of work basically delineates exactly what has to go on to get the field ready for play. And that was a lot of back and forth. Um, I'll give you some four examples because that's kind of a lot to grab unless you deal with it on a day to day. Uh, so for example, the scope of work from FEMA may say, roll up the carpet, haul it off, dispose of it properly and put down new turf. Well, you hear in that description, there's no, there's nothing addressing the drainage field beneath. There's nothing addressing the fencing or perimeter that will be impacted and, you know, to put down new turf. Uh, there's nothing addressing utilities, any of that. And so reaching agreement on what the full scope of work is and what the damage estimate is, is huge. And it has been a lot of back and forth. I'd like to commend CDC who's worked on this project from the beginning. Uh, they started way back in uh, October, November, um, trying to get ahead of this thing because they knew it's going to be a long, drawn-out process. I'd like to thank uh, Josh and uh, Deb Jones and um, um, Geneva Frady who have been hit with this stuff and constant theme of phone calls in trying to reach a central point where every all parties agreed. And so that's been huge. So now we know the work we are to do and that FEMA will fund. And it is, uh, the money is not yet obligated. I wanna be clear on that. It is not yet obligated by FEMA. But in talking to Joe Stanton, uh, there's no penalty and no chance or risk of us losing money by going ahead and beginning work. Uh, the rest is just uh, a matter of procedure or process. Next steps that we do not have to wait on are um, the scope of work is signed and sent to FEMA headquarters. It's packaged, it's put in a million dollar package and uh, a Congress a man or woman is assigned that package and it has their, it bears their name. So when the money comes, it'll come from Congressman or woman, whatever, choose your name. Uh, so that's, it's literally uh, just procedure from this point on. And so we've been working uh, and on, in conversation on calls already. Just the minute we learned of that, I think that news came to us on Tuesday. And we've been working with AstroTurf. I can tell you that AstroTurf uh, is highly motivated to help us. Uh, they can't estrange current customers and may, maybe future customers. We can all understand that. Uh, but they also see our plight and are very inclined to help. And so um, we're excited uh, that th these phases um, are behind us and that money is in hand. Um, not yet, but it, it's coming um, to begin work on, on the field. So one thing I need to make perfectly clear, what I'm discussing is for the field work only, okay? There is a whole nother side to this. The whole other side is the utilities, the electrical, uh, the water, the sewage, and that is proving to be very challenging. We hope to have a finalized set of plans. It's still in design phase. We hope to have a finalized set of plans for the utilities, the electrical, sewer, and water by mid-July. Um, and then it's, it's going to be like everything else in the world right now. How readily available is a contractor and how readily available are the materials to that contractor? Um, how quickly can we get through the bidding process? I'll give you a for example. Um, we did receive one bidder for baseball, for the baseball fields. And because there was only one bidder, you have to re-advertise for two weeks. So that creates another two-week delay. 
If in two weeks we still only have the one bidder, we can accept that one bidder, but not before it's re-advertised for two weeks to try and solicit three bidders. Uh, what I can tell you, um, uh, this uh, board has already selected contractors for softball uh, and football fields. Uh, soon you will be selecting uh, utility contractors for football and softball fields and for baseball fields. So it's, it's important, and, and anyone who's watching, I guess this is for the general public, when we talk about um, making progress forward, we are talking about fields only. The utilities is far more involved. Um, I was part to a discussion just today. Um, this is where the mitigation comes in, and this is how it gets frustrating. We may have to move any water pressure tanks uh, or hot water heaters to the roof of existing structures to keep them out of the flood water or potential flood water in the future. The wiring for all of that will have to be elevated beyond such so that, the, again, the wa flood waters do not reach uh, the electrical. Uh, I haven't heard any word on the water and sewer just yet. Uh, it's, we're mostly going back and forth on electrical and what, where those components must be placed. So that's a far more involved process. Okay, I'd like to comment. Uh, I think I want to thank you and uh, Josh Meese and his whole staff for getting this done as quickly as possible because it's remarkable to be where you're at at this time right now. So thank you all so much. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, though, I agree. All the folks he named except for me deserve that. So. <laughs> you put in a lot of hard work as well, so you, you're deserving as well. Here, here's the thing I, I, I will be very proud of uh, when this is complete. You're hearing the delay with the electrical and how much further behind it is and how complex it is and how much longer it's going to take. If we do this the right way this time, future generations will not contend with that. They will not be elevating electrical. They will not be setting uh, hot water heaters and, and water pressure tanks up out of the floodway. That work will be done. And it'll basically be a clean out and replace the field. Um, and we will have a permit to move forward more readily because we already have one. And we will exist on a flood map. And we will be able to claim that it does not create a rising situation or a no rise. Um, much of this is just work that just needed to be done and it has slowed it beyond a pace that I am comfortable operating in. I like to move a whole lot quicker, um, but in the end, when it's done, it will be done right and any future board or person in my position will be able to move forward a whole lot more expeditiously than, than we've been able to. Yeah, I'd like to accommodate y'all as well because it's, uh, it's great. So everybody on the committees and even the CDC and them, they've, re they've done a lot of hard work on this. I've just had one thought that keeps running through my mind. I don't know, is, you know, you're replacing the field to get that part ready. I know we still got to work on the electrical and the water and sewer. Do we have any lines currently running under the fields that's going to have to be taken back out later on? Or are they just going to eliminate them, block them, you know, cap them off and move everything above ground? Yeah. Um, in the end zone nearest um, Evergreen, uh, there are some, yeah. there's quite a few lines under there. Um, we've already anticipated that a little bit. And, and rather than slow the field work, uh, it doesn't seem like that work would be substantial or far more costly, so we would probably abandon those. And create new lines. Create new out lines. From yeah, that's what I was thinking. Because I mean, if we repair a field and then have to turn around and tear the end end zone up again to get some wiring out of the way. It, right. Yeah. We we try to move quicker where we can without doing work that is counterproductive. So that's you bring up a great point. We certainly wouldn't want to get it down and have to dig up electrical no, lines. So we'll do that again. Um, 
you know, uh, again, for anyone listening, the the uh, electrical works there, works right now, but it works fine. But yeah, you can't do we, that. We are not authorized to <laughs> use it. Um, so does the plumbing. So I just I don't want to paint a picture that uh, everything's broke, but it will require that it all be tested before we can power it up uh, every line. Um, I know Mr. Kirkpatrick uh, deals in that and Mr. Nesbitt does as well. If you can imagine the number of wires going into them and the size of those panel boxes down there, everyone's got to be tested and tested all the way through. Um, and a good bit of it uh, is going to have to be replaced because it was improperly installed when it was put in. Um, and that that is irrelevant to the flood. It does not meet code, so it'll have to be brought up to code. So, All right. I want to say thank you also, but make sure when you get done with this, you take all your files, you put them in a gold-plated box, and you put them in a vault. So the next person, if you're not the person to deal with it next time on the flood, they got everything. I put it to the there cloud. And not having to try to dig it out of the archives of the state and the county and the town and stuff so i was going to put them in all the concession work. stand uh, yeah, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> under, under yeah under the stadium right yeah under the stadium in the yeah. concession stand yeah. I, mm -hmm. I thought that'd be good storage all right thank you dr putnam thank um, you all right any other questions there all right dr nolte uh, yes uh yes, quickly in uh taylor garland our chief financial officer may want to add some things mm -hmm. I know Taylor uh, will want to talk about this in any detail with finance that the Finance Committee wants to talk about, but just a brief overview because I know when we bring stuff out of committee sometimes uh, it triggers questions from people who are in a different committee meeting. So just tr tried to get as many people as possible. Uh, we were notified um, uh, early uh, this year that the state was going to discontinue the 403B program that they currently offer through Prudential. I believe it's through, Pruden through Prudential. And they're getting out of a lot of businesses you all will remember, business operations you all will remember that they decided a year or so ago that they would not do installment um, provisions for our employees through the state. And so we came up with a way to do that and we we believe it is appropriate to also do that for our employees our employees are our greatest resource uh, and asset and so we have been we were asked to get this back to them may 31st um, and what we did in short and we'll answer any questions about it was we didn't want to add providers to our list of people who offer programs like this we have seven or eight already and i'm sure taylor knows the exact number more like 10. we have several uh, companies that are grandfathered in that have been providing 403b services for our employees for quite some time and what we're actually required to do is to name one um, that can be used if an employee who has funds in the state program wants them shifted into another 403B with us, sort of a default program, and they and they fail to name it. We, they've already received the list of, of uh, companies that we have that they can transfer over to, but we need to establish a default one. And so we, through, uh, I'm joking just a little bit here, I know it's a serious matter because it's money, but we simply picked the, the one that uh, we've had for a while that serves the most employees or former employees over 300 and so we sent this form in but we would ask you to consider it on Monday and approve the selection um, of um, let me read the right name here the selection of uh, National Life Group, which, which again, we've had them for quite some time. So, Taylor, do you want to add anything now or you want to wait for finance? Okay. Any questions? 
board. sent you a brief text about this, but that was just to let you know it was coming. And you also have some information in your, your packet. That's well. right. You have this document Look in your at. packet. Any questions on it? All right. So this will come before finance and we'll bring it out of finance to the to the big board. Okay. All right. well, the chairman Francis asked me to put the other item on there and of course he's not here. I don't know if you all want to speak to that or not. I know you've been interviewed by the papers and asked all kinds of questions about that. So Yeah. I did talk to Chuck a little bit about this, and um, he basically said if if we wanted to discuss it, we could, or we can wait and discuss it uh, at, a, at a later time. But it is involving the uh, the bill, um, I believe, before the House uh, from Mark Pless, and I don't know who else is co-sponsoring that to make um, uh, all races uh, partisan races. And you know, school board currently is is nonpartisan, so it would it would have a, an effect on those uh, running uh, in the future for school board. So if anybody wants to make a comment, we can. If not, we can. No, this came up several years ago with Miss Presnell when yes. she was representative, and uh, it was defeated, or we were taken out of the bill at Haywood County Schools. And the discussion then was kind of similar to it is now. I mean. I feel like this county and, and where we're at now, I know some areas probably really need that, uh, but it makes it so political, which our school system should be, like I say, it's a public school system, and I really feel like the people need to have that choice. They, they're they saying that they, they don't know who's running or they don't know where they stand. Uh, I kind of feel like that's kind of false information because you have the public forums and uh, there's been pretty well where everybody stands over the years. I, uh, I just, I, I kind of hate to see it happen uh, personally, and uh, I feel like it's causing us to, to have to make some decisions, partisan decisions, government getting involved, which we want free public schools and we want to be able to serve everyone in every aspect. And I just, you know, Personally, I just don't like the idea of it becoming a partisan situation. I didn't like it before, and I don't like it now, and I haven't talked with Representative Pless, but I've talked with some other representatives and senators, and so hopefully this will uh, go away as well. Well, the only thing is, you know, we signed a letter to all of us that was on the board at the time go against it yeah I mean we have we have made a statement drafted it fast. Fast. yeah I don't know if I drafted or if Pat did but somebody it did was and a then we sent it in that's what I told Corey and or, yeah we we have I think when it came up in the past we did make a statement as a board and um, I think chairman Francis was just wanting to see if, if we still feel that way if we feel like we need to make another statement or the statement we've made in the past is you know good enough to stand I know there's some some areas that had already submitted a referendum to the legislature on this, so like I could say, we we may need to write another one. I don't mind doing it again. And I also didn't know that, like the town of Canton, I didn't know that theirs wasn't partisan. The, the local, like the towns, I didn't know that. Hey, you didn't mean, yeah, they're not. So. so it was some. They said some judges and towns, and then school board. But yeah, I'm a, I'm open to do another letter. <coughs> okay. Right. We'll share, or you all can share, I guess, with the chairman Francis, and you all can decide what you want to do and when you want to do it. Thank you. That's fair. Thanks. Okay. All right. And Dr. Nolte, you want to tell us about the open house coming up at central office? Yeah, just two announcements at the end before we go into closed session to discuss some personnel. We're having an open house uh, next Tuesday on the 14th of June from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. Uh, we have posted some stuff online and sent some information out to the community inviting our employees and the community. Um, we did send a couple uh, personal direct messages to uh, county manager commissioners. I reached out to former superintendents just to let them know uh, when this was uh, open house was going to be. And so we just invite people in. It's an old building, but it is 
uh, really the best office building I've ever worked in. It's it's an office uh, rather than a hospital room or a uh, classroom. classroom. And um, the offices are not big, but they're big enough. And we have some uh, training areas and um, some things to save energy with the lights going on and off by themselves. And I want to echo uh, what you all said earlier about the uh, flood relief work. And again, um, Dr. Putnam, Josh Meese, uh, working with the construction company, I think given the age of that building has done a really good job. We, we uh, still have to find a little more money probably to get it paid for, but we'll talk about that when we get a little closer to the end. Yeah, I'd like to say I was there Tuesday for a policy meeting and uh, I tell you, it's very nice. I, I was real impressed and uh, say I think everybody involved in that did again a good job and a great job and taking good care of our employees, uh, everybody I saw. Oh, thank you, thank you. I said, well, wasn't me. Look at your staff. But anyway, it was a uh, it's a very nice facility. I, I was very impressed too. Like you say, it's a very old building. Been in there many days when I was a young and all the way through. So uh, it's nice, but it's designed the way it should be. <clears throat> one one other announcement that um, was just finalized yesterday after the agenda went out. Uh, Dr. Putnam and I are meeting with the sheriff and chiefs just to review everything that we do with school safety. Uh, we feel like we have lots of things in place, some that we tell the public about and some that we intentionally don't because we don't want ill-minded people to know some of the things that we do. And if that group comes up with any proposals, then we'll get with uh, county or town officials because we've already talked about our local current expense budget. <laughs> if, if we do a lot of additional stuff, someone else will have to have to pay for it. That being that mentioned that, Dr. Naldi, I was uh, around the sheriff's office, and there's a lot of talk. Well, of course, it's on the news too about safety and everything in schools, and they've got all kinds of proposals out there as far as having retired military or either current military people come in and volunteer time or retired uh, police personnel. And so, I know that's a big buzz, and I'm sure hoping that federal is going to kick in a lot of big bucks to help help us have better school safety and if you have a school don't have a resource officer it's been okay now I heard probation officers may be stopping by schools now and it's it's just a great thing that you know we we're trying and uh, Lord help us I, I hope we never have anything like that happen around here and hope we never have it really in anywhere anymore that uh, but like you say there's some ill-minded people in this world and but there's there's all kinds of buzz going around about new new ideas as far as having someone in that school that's armed and knows how to handle handle difficulty situations and um, so I, I think it's 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 working and I appreciate our sheriff's office too and our, our local law enforcement in their counties and cities and our towns and everything they've really been really been good to us and like you say we just need that funding because we need them there we're, we'll meet a little closer to the end of the month, and then certainly anything that looks like it might be a decision, we'll come back to you folks and um, and reach out to funding sources. Well, and speaking of that, uh, just like Jimmy said, it's something that just I was thinking about it. When was the last time, how many school resource officers do we have right now? Seven? We have one at uh, every high school high school and middle school right which is um, at the the college provides one for the early college so we have Central Haywood um, and again during the flooding they used Waynesville middles obviously because they were on that campus we have Central Haywood Tuscola Pisgah and then the three middle schools so we have six Seven. I, I thought well I thought we had seven but uh, uh, like I said we may I may not be able to remember okay. when was the last time and this is sort of a sore subject for me to begin with because at the point we had different commissioners that was on the board uh, one or 
think two was still on there when we went through this, when we did go to them and ask for more school resource officers and we asked for, I think, two more psychologists and maybe two more social workers, whatever it was, and we was trying to get those school resource officers after <coughs> Sandy Hook. That was after Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we asked them, and they acted like they was wanting to do something, but then they throwed something up that they was wanting to do if we were, would agree to it. This board did not agree to it, so we did not get the school resource officers that we wanted, that I thought that we needed, on top of more guidance counselors and social workers, because now, on top of everything else, when it comes to gun violence in schools or whatever, ever how you want to say it, we've got a mental issue problem in school, Amen. which we need to get control of the best we can at the school level. Now, obviously, in yours's position, teachers' positions, principals' positions, they cannot handle all that. So that's where we need more people to work with the mental issue of the kids after we've went through this COVID. I just think it's time that we start asking for more personnel in those departments for the county commissioners to put to us, yes, they will help us or no, they won't. And I think, like I said, it's more of a mental health issue now than it is anything else because we have screwed these kids over for the last three years. So, I mean, I think we need to, whatever comes out of the school resource officers, I think we need to ask for some more because some of these outlined schools like Meadowbrook and Canton, North Canton, North Canton's right on the interstate. I mean, it's closer than Pisgah. And then we've got Riverbend right off the interstate. I mean, all these elementary schools, if you, if you start noticing, a lot of the high schools are not getting hit. Your elementary schools are the ones that's getting hit because where are the targets? It's easy. So I think we need to ask for the school resource officers, maybe not in every one of the schools, but they need to start dividing at least some somewhere. And I think it, it's time that we start asking the county commissioners once again for this, since they bucked us on the last time. Well, our next meeting is in a couple of weeks to help plan that with law enforcement. Uh, we, we consider those our local safety experts. Uh -huh. And then we, we're certainly not afraid to ask. Uh -huh. So we'll proceed and keep you all informed. Well, Dr. Nolte, I appreciate it. Last week, you. You know, we talked about resource officers, and uh, of course my suggestion was that we get them in all elementary schools, and I still would like to see that. However, we have the funding formula and the where's the money coming from conversation, and so uh, I, do, uh, I do appreciate you, and I know you're going to ask and you're going to try to find some funds to help out and look for ways to look for resource officers because I do believe that our teachers, our principals, and our staff is uh, probably across the county and across the country are doing all they can do right now and uh, they really don't want to be sitting ducks. So uh, at the same time, I do think that's got to go, uh, we got to talk about that in the county, we got to talk about it in the state, and got to talk about it as a, in the federal level and everything. But I know you had mentioned that you might be able to get a one year Deal and then it bought, we'd probably own it from that point. So we do need a permanent solution. Yeah, one of, and again, y'all know I can make a long meeting too long, but one of my personal frustrations, and I've expressed this publicly to the media through the years, is that when we have situations like this, the state typically gives us a short term solution, or the federal government gives us a short term solution and then we have to try to pay for it locally. And the truth of the matter is, this is Bill Nolte speaking, not the board, is there's not enough local money to cover what does not come from the state and federal government. 
much larger proportions come from those larger areas. Um, and uh, so what we typically get is you can get a grant from the state for an SRO for a year or two and then it goes away. Uh, we have hired a number of people to help with mental health, uh, a load of them, uh, during COVID, but that is because of the COVID impact on mental health. And that money, as we've talked about before in finance and work sessions, is going away. That money's going away, and uh, we're adding uh, counseling assistance at every elementary school to work with the counselors. Uh, we've added uh, some licensed clinical social workers because we lost our mental health contract of people who would actually come in the building. We have put that back out for bid, so we'll see uh, if we get anything. I don't know that we've received any of the bids back. Um, and we've added some help at the high schools just to help the uh, counselors free up some of their time. But that money will go away in a couple years. So that's the, that's the frustrating part. We need ongoing funding from a reliable source. And I know that we probably need to get more from the, the local county commissioners, and they, they'll probably be interested in it. But I also know just from working with budgets for all these years, you can't supplant everything that comes from the state or federal government. So it would be nice if any of the state or federal officials are listening just to go ahead and give us some, and then maybe we can get the, the local folks to, to fill, in the, fill in the cracks nice. or fill in the gaps. I want to add to it. I agree with what they're saying. But the thing about it is if, if we don't be proactive, we're going to be like the rest of the community, reactive. I think we need to meet with the commissioners. We've got two big issues. We've got a funding formula. And we got we got with gasoline and inflation, and now we've got safety. Oh, definitely. And so we're get, we need to ask for. We'll see what the sheriff says and and the chiefs. But if they say we need a resource officer at each school, then we need to demand the county commissioners if they want to expand this homeless shelter and bring people in the middle of the night, and the crime rates doubled. In Waynesville, then they need to protect our children. And it don't need to be an ask. It means me to demand because then we need to put it in their laps. Because I don't want people coming to me and saying, These, you're, you let our kids get killed. I'm saying, no, I'm dead when let your kids get killed. You can go talk to the commissioners because at, at the, they hold the purse strings. But if you think about this, this is getting ridiculous. Jails, dog houses, homeless shelters uh, keep expanding, expanding, expanding. How did we go from 200 homeless children to 400 in four years? If they ain't bringing them, if we don't have children going to schools, where are they come from? I mean, everybody in the county, everybody tells me they're bringing them in in the middle of the night. I don't know that, but something ain't right. I, it's just, about got me fuzzed. Well, <laughs> well, Mr. Ronnie, I agree with you 100%. Just always remember, every politician, and I'm going to say every politician, we are all politicians, but we're sitting on the school board. We ran to protect every kid, to make sure that every kid gets the best education they can. That's the reason why we're all on this school board. We don't want to see no kid fail. I don't. I shouldn't say, well, I ain't speaking for everybody. Myself, I don't want to see any kid fail, any kid harm. I've always tried to do my best when it comes to that. But every politician always says it's always about the kid. Always about the kids, always about the kids, always about education. Where is the least amount of money coming to? Education. Education is the least amount of money coming in. So tell me, any politician out there, when you say it's all about the kids, Put the money where the mouth is, and then you'll see who where your most valued people are. It should be in with the teachers, administration, and the kids. It's, all right, I got all my.
<laughs> but also we don't have a resource officer at the HCLC, correct? Does well, we will now because now. they're okay. they're joining the campus with oh, the right, okay. Central Haywood. Okay, good, good. Because that that's a whole you, you know we graduated sixty kids. There's a lot of kids going in and out of there, so it's just as important as every other school. It can't be a side project, you know. So that was that was also a reason for the consolidation. You saved positions by moving them together. We tried that uh, in the way of the Educational Support Center. That was the goal. Anytime you merge campuses and facilities, you are able to have the personnel you need. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to conclude the uh, work session for June. Um, and we are going to go into closed session to discuss some personnel matters, but we will be taking no action in that meeting. So we'll uh, adjourn from that meeting. Um, so at this time, do I hear a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Okay, Mr. Rogers uh, made the motion, seconded by Mr. Clark. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we're going to closed session. Thank you.